So I'm glad we've got to this spread because this is one of my absolute favourites in the book. And, and interestingly, east coast of America, New Hampshire, yeah. and, uh, and the desert southwest. And you can see the designers had fun finding these two pictures they, to work they together. They fit fantastically, don't they? They do. And it, it is very striking how he sees the geological world and the, the, uh, the, the world of trees as if they almost as if they were living beings well they're living beings in the case of trees but yeah. as if they were almost animals I mean this is like a seal isn't it sort of somehow uh, and you know, the very very fine sensitivity of composition everything's yes. very clearly rendered making such good use of Ed shapes edges and touches where things touch where things coincide yeah it's beautifully done classic and, and here we've got the tree just at the horizon just in the corner Brilliant. I think um, it's wonderful it, Exactly. He's, had, he's obviously had to place this little branch over the Green River uh, details in a distance, and yet it all works uh, because of the, of the discipline with which the composition mm. is executed. Everything folds and forms. It gets darker in the corners. It's somehow just right. Incidentally, one of the things, one of the benefits of using a large format camera is that wide-angle lens is vignette. So yeah. naturally, um, you look at this picture, see how bright it is here. Well, can you imagine it was that much darker over there? Of course, yeah. it, of course it wasn't. That, no. that is a natural bit of lens vignetting, but he's used it to great effect here. Well, you can see along the skyline as well, going from dark to light to dark, etc. Exactly. This is another place, by the way, where I've been, been there? to look for that bristlecone pine. <laughs> and the, and these, are, these are aged enough that they'll still be there, exactly the same they're, probably from one, still there. one decade to another. But of course they never look the same. That's the interesting thing. Mm. Cause light just is so, so variable all the time. And the mood and atmosphere of this day, the, what makes this picture is totally specific to the light and atmosphere and on that particular day. That's what we could say is a horrible day, because it looks overcast, uh, it looks very, very hazy. Very, I, 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 well, it's, yeah, and, and to be fair, it can't be that hazy because that is at least oh, 40 yeah. miles away. Um, but in, in terms of the American Midwest, it's certainly very overcast and that's unusual. So he's made full use of it. I love seeing that picture because it reminds me of Ansel Adams', uh, which is a different place, I think, but Mount Whitney. Oh, yeah. It is Mount Whitney. Yeah, no, it is. Yeah. It, it, with the boulder field. Yes. And, the, and those wonderful rays. Uh, that, that I think most people looking at Landscape GB will know. Uh, and, and, and yes, it's in colour. It's, uh, you know, gold and blue. So good classic use of colour contrast there. That's quite radical. It's, yeah, it doesn't fit in with the rest of the no. book, having seen it. But he's quite yeah. happy to let things almost relax. He's, he's switched off his graphic head. I think and, I, I think that's right. I mean, he's uh, he's not uh, doesn't make too many harsh judgments. It's almost he's he's shooting things as, as he finds them. And uh, what what we don't know is how many thousands and thousands of transparencies have been trawled through to get this wonderful collection. Yeah. But it is a great collection, and you know, I never would judge anybody negatively because they've edited well. Would this be one of his first books? I'm not sure about. I mean, we can find out when I, I put the article in. But mm. I, I think it's one of the, one of the first. Big books he did, wasn't it? Yeah, I would say book. that's true, but yeah, I, this, I, I want to. And that is fantastically it. graphic, isn't it? it? You bet, yeah, and great use of colour, mm. uh, indeed. And, and it's, uh, again, it comes from a tradition of landscape photography. You can think of, of Ansel Adams and, and Edward Weston out in the, uh, uh, their dunes, um, but, but done in colour and done, done so, so effectively as well. Sometimes I think I find that. A little much, you know. The polarized, is, uh, probably polarized, and uh, and th this is an area where maybe maybe it's a fault of transparency film. But I think when you shoot, uh, it, it is at White Sands, which is not particularly high above sea level for the Colorado Plateau, but uh, the polarizer has rendered the, the blues as black. I'm yeah, not sure they that want works to get, for me. They go indigo almost, and they it's, mm. it's a very odd color. Difficult. Uh, perhaps it's partly a CMYK issue as well. I love this picture though. Very contrasty again, but so delicate the way he sees the grasses against the, uh, the, the shadowed dune in the background. This uh, is very similar in its style to the uh, Dead Horse Point picture yes. when you think of uh, the, the structure of the composition and the use, of, e even better use in some ways, of these lovely fins. They're not quite fins, but uh, layers, layers yeah. of sandstone, just as the. It's called the light, fantastic, yeah, there, hasn't it? With the, uh, the light washing it across them. And not, I'm not, I don't think it's filtered because the blues are coming through very nicely from the shadows as well. 
I agree. I agree. Whereas Bryce Canyon, this is not one of my favourite pictures of his. Uh, I think he possibly has reached for the filter there and it hasn't done him any favours because it actually kind of kills off Flam some of the, uh, the cooler it. tones in the shadows. Yeah. This is not my favourite area of the book, in fact. I've never been a big fan of that, uh, of Rainbow Bridge. But Mesa Arch, that's unusual. You know, not a sunrise. It, that's right, not a sunrise. Photographed it in the evening with the light behind and the late sunlight on the distant mountains. And there's something quite kind of awesome about that. Space. There's a lot of space in America. There certainly wa mm. was a great deal. A little bit less now than perhaps there was. I wonder how successful he is at capturing that kind of essence. This is the Grand Canyon here. And New back Hampshire. in New Hampshire. That's so quite an odd collection of pictures that fit together. Very eclectic. Quite impressionistic. I mean, I don't know if you feel this, but looking through this, his style seems to be incredibly varied. You know, he's able to use different, different yeah. lenses, different approaches. Other photographers will tend to stick more closely to one particular way of seeing. He'll see anything and everything. I mean, th this to me is the worst spread in the book. That's quite extraordinarily warmed up, isn't it? But is that my prejudice? Uh, yeah, to me that looks a bit like a like a B and H um, filter ad from the nineteen seventies. Yeah. Coke and tobacco grad. And and very reluctant to say anything that sounds critical. I think sometimes that um, you know that you have to allow for that sort of moment, and it, it does reflect perhaps a moment in time when things were done in in that way, mm. um, and where you could argue, well, the whites are. It's almost more like a monochrome interpretation. You know, it's like a, a monochrome image gone gold. And there, there was a cultural aesthetic for pictures like that at the time, though, there was, was there, definitely. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I think perhaps because most of his images are so naturalistic, it comes, it, it jars a little as, mm. you, as you come across it. These are in Death Valley, which is a tough landscape to shoot in. Mm. I've not, I haven't seen pictures taken from on high, as it were, down into Death Valley like that. Dante's view, that's above the um, uh, artist's palette area. should really have Mr Ward here explaining yeah. uh, the lie of the land. But this is, is curious, and it's another curiosity of David Mudge, the in-camera double exposure. Double exposure, yes. Uh, which, it confused which, me when I first saw it. I was yeah, trying to figure which out. which catches you out, but it, it, quite effective. Not my favourite pictures of his, I have to say. In fact, this is not my favourite section. Shiprock, that's an interesting, amazing, amazing place in northwestern New Mexico. Very popular with photographers in America. Yeah, it is. And it is. The clouds here are the most extraordinary thing. And, and archetypically Midwest mm. as well. So as, as we go through, we'll see that, that it's the... In many ways, I think you could, you could go to a, a contemporary magazine that was majoring on landscape, be it a big feature or, or a, say an outdoor photography um, type magazine and find these kinds of styles still very, very popular today. So in many ways, I think it's not, you know, we're not unreasonable to say he is definitely ahead of his time. That's a technique I love to see and that I definitely use, still use a lot, which is to have foreground in shadow, background in sunlight. Yes. Uh, evokes a tremendous sense of depth and so well done there. Again, makes you wonder wonder at the at the technique of the man to be able to hold the highlights perhaps without any help. It doesn't look graduated because process. there's it doesn't. There's no toning increase in the shadows here. That's right. Olympic. So that's the uh, west coast of the United States in Washington State. I love this picture. I think it's incredibly It's a rainbow picture and I've not... Yeah, I like it. I normally don't like rainbow pictures, but it's effective for its use because he's seen the bottom half of the rainbow as well. Yes. And you know why that is? Because it's shot at sunset. The sun is very, very low in the sky yeah. and he's, he's actually above. He's able to see the, the curve literally coming yeah. back and below. And, you know, without getting into a long diatribe about rainbows, Hasn't he done a great job of that when mm -hmm. you look at this line of surf and the, the kind of graphic relationship that there is between them? It's just a wonderful atmosphere and quite soft. Not a, you know, not, not at all a kind of chocolate boxy rendering of no. it. Um, it's very, very moody. Beautiful image. More classic. Grand Tetons. Yeah, we'll move swiftly on. Very good picture, but perhaps nothing new. And I think as we go through, and I think we're probably going to have to, to move on here. Uh, yeah, we, um, we can skip to the... We'll find Classics. some, yeah, just, just to try and pick out the ones that... Re I think this one, I've, 
I was very struck by when I first saw it and thinking, well, how many pictures like that have I ever seen? And I think the answer is none. Uh, to, to the uh, sun setting over the ocean showed a very long lens, or fairly long lens on 5 by 4 with using the motion blur so powerfully, mm. I would guess that's maybe an eighth of a second, quarter of a second perhaps. But it's beautiful. The, the sense way of that col colour in it is fantastic. Yeah. The tonality yes. is in there. It makes it quite uh, impressionistic in a way. Never been a big fan of Big Sur no. photographs. No, it doesn't do a great deal for me either. Although that is atmospheric as, as they come. But, uh, and it, it's not something you see a great deal of in the UK, is it? This kind of no. fog banks coming us to do with the cold ocean, warm land phenomenon that they have. <laughs> that looks like it shot on tungsten film. I'm yes. not sure if it was or not. And, and maybe it was. Uh, that, that was a technique that, that, that was sometimes used. Pres presumably that's a, a long, long exposure, though. So I would say so. Heading, heading into strange reciprocity effects. Yeah, presumably that. Yeah, it would be interesting to know. It's, it's actually quite a striking image. Yeah. This is that. That is a very modern aesthetic from the pictures I've seen um, of current American photographers doing. Right. Yeah, uh, and and very bold colours as well. Yeah, yeah, in incredible and slightly unbelievable, but not totally. Um, I, I think there's maybe a little too much yellow mm. in the greens, but the, there's still for me it's still naturalistic enough to be believable. The white highlights of, of the waterfall are. Are very burnt out. Now, it actually doesn't worry me too much. I think it's it, it, it's fine there. Perhaps, again, when we think of modern digital cameras, we know we could recover yeah. bright highlights, couldn't we, from a raw file? And uh, it, it does make you think, in some ways, that photography's moved on. Not always for the better. More con more control with it. Blah, more control. Yeah. Quite often, a lot of these pictures are working because they're working within a limited contrast range. I think, as we we've, we were saying earlier. Agreed. Yeah. Is try, trying to work even if you have a large dynamic range with negatives or, or uh, digital cameras. Mm. Trying to still reduce the contrast range you're working in is beneficial. I think. I think so. There is an aesthetic associated with this kind of light to make the most of these these tones, the mid tones, uh, the texture. Um, you know, using soft light is often more effective than, than simply because you can shoot a very wide range than you do. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, many of the great master landscape photographers, their best work is, you know, made in these sorts of conditions. And the subtlety and softness that that reveals to us, and also the fact that often these pictures are made when perhaps other people wouldn't necessarily go out. Yes. And so it's unfamiliar. Perhaps most people would go for a walk when the weather's nice, you know, when it's yes, sunny, sunny and, and so on. And, and yet so many of these are shot in, in light that gives a totally different mood and feeling to them. It's a very peculiar picture. Very peculiar picture, very odd place. Uh, I've seen so many pictures of the great, great Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, I think it is, isn't it? Lower uh, the Lower Falls of, yeah, of the Yellowstone. And it's very, very hard to get your head around it. It's an unusual spread with the two images on this side. Uh, I think you can see what the designer is trying to Breaking do. Breaking waves. Yeah, yes. yeah, exactly. But that's a very it's bold, nice modernist fun. kind of composition, yes. isn't it? Yeah. Uh, the, the kind of almost bleached out white sky, uh, which I note the printer's put a bit of tone in there. That, that's the mark of a very, very able printer. It was printed in France, by the way, counterintuitively right. for an American book. Yeah. But what wonderful colour and texture in there. And I think his sense of composition is also very subtle. While he used bold gestures, there is that richness. He doesn't deny the, the complexity of the landscape in, in these images. So I think it's, it's just fascinating to discover them. Quite interesting to compare this style, say, with Shinzo Maeda, who is another photographer who uh, we're very fond of, whose style is, I would say, much narrower in its approach. Yes. Um, equally good, talented, but, uh, but the, there's, a, there's a kind of a wonderful, all-embracing approach uh, to, to the art that David Munch brings to, to the, his photography. You can see a lot more of the photographer in these pictures than you would do in something like Shinzo Maeda. You can, yes, because, I think because, that's true. Um, there's overt compositions where a lot, a lot of the Shinzo Maeda's work tends to Tends to, it, it looks just observed. It yes, may not be, yeah. but it looks observed. Yeah, there's a coolness to it in that sense. Yeah. 
wildflowers, more wildflowers. I think we'll see quite a bit of that in this final section on renewal, although I think of all of the pictures that illustrate renewal, this is probably the best, mm -hmm. with the flowers appearing on uh, the lava dome here. It's a wonderful line of flowers receding into the background. Yes, using little points of light and colour. Well, I have to say, yeah. as we approach the end of the book, I feel you know probably more in awe of David Munch than ever because how did he do it? You know, th th most of these images were made thirty to forty years ago, mm. and and they are still, I think, absolutely fresh today. Uh, while other people have done more and moved in different directions, there's a kind of coherence and a confidence to his compositions, particularly that that really stands the test of time for me. It does look like he's very happy doing what he's happy doing. He do, he, he, you don't see any, very, well, apart from the odd occasional one, you don't see anything of the of the fashion of sure. photography going through. Yeah. yeah, there doesn't seem to be a, a, an eye on that at all. The occasional square crop, I notice. I don't know if these are shot on 5.4 uh, uh, or on Hasselblad or similar mm -hmm. camera. Uh, perhaps they are, but uh, the picture we see of him in the back is he's very definitely a large yeah. format shooter, isn't he? And he's still doing workshops, I believe, as well. Mm -hmm. At the, the age of yeah. eight, eight, was it 80? Uh, 1932? 1936. 36. So about 70, late 70s. Right. Um, we, need to, we need to sign up for one of them. Yeah, I'd love to, yes. <laughs> And this is another of his peculiar <laughs> multiple exposures. That that quite confusing when I first saw it in the book. It's um, that's almost a soft drugs moment, isn't it? Really? <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Uh, it is hard to understand. Quite effective though. He's, he he's taken a sunset shot and overlaid it with a yes. possibly a shot looking in the opposite direction. I'd love to know it? if it was deliberate or whether it was one of those happy accidents. Yeah. He doesn't reveal. In fact, if, if I have any criticism of the book. It's, I'd love to know more. Yes. There's very, very little in the book about how the images were made. What they were taken on. What where, they were, yeah. yeah, exactly. Or indeed the context, uh, perhaps some of his yeah. thoughts about composition and lighting or, or any of the technical side. Um, he talks about the kind of spiritual element and the, the kind of environmentalist. And, and, you know, very much from the environmentalist perspective. Mm. Um, and I think... You know, that marks him out as another sort of pioneer in a way. Um, although it, it's something that we associate, I hope we associate with landscape photographers as a concern for the environment. I, I have no, um, we're looking at Chris Bell or interviewing Chris Bell in a future one, and he, he has four books, and none of his books reference the camera apart from one page in the back that it says, that I use these three cameras. Mm. And I think it must be an, an environmentalist thing saying this is, P it's possibly. not about me, the photographer, it's about. Yes, about the about, what I'm uh, about the landscape. Yeah, and I, I think that that's that's quite possibly true. I think this is the final spread. So if we leave it there just for a second, um, and I, I think that is. I also wonder if it's a reflection of an earlier era when people were quite reluctant to share their secrets. I know when mm. I was a young photographer in London, there were no workshops. Nobody did. You didn't go and find out how to do things. You had to find out for yourself. Um, the, there was a notion that if you shared your uh, techniques or ideas with other people that you'd, you'd lose work and it's a shame because it's not a generous point of view yeah. and I think one thing that's been great about the m modern world the internet particularly is you can find things out and find out how to do things and certainly when you look at the way landscape photography is developed that's very very clear uh, but isn't it fantastic to revisit the work of an old master if, if David Mitchell forgive me for describing him as such and, and to find that his work more than stands the test of time. Yeah, and and continues to. There's there's a series of books about America, ancient America, and American places, which are similarly themed and, and still have such great photography. In. And while and, and perhaps show work that he'd done in the subsequent uh, decade or two, perhaps with some of the more modern films and uh, and techniques. So, perhaps at some point in the future we can we can revisit him and look at one of those books. Indeed, thank you. Pleasure.